Thank you very much for your for this invitation. So it's really a pleasure for me to be back here in Bielefeld, where I spent some of the best uh, years of my life uh, until now. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, I was uh, here a student. I started here in 1974, where this building was not uh, yet existing. So we had our lectures in the first year somewhere spread over Bielefeld. And uh, I was among the students who had their very first lecture here in this new building. Uh, at that time, I, as a mathematician, uh, I, my teacher was uh, Karl Peter Grotelmeier, a very an excellent teacher, and uh, he was the rector of the university. And uh, we uh, did this illegally. Uh, so before it was actually permitted doing any having any activities here, we already had our evening lectures with him on topology. <laughs> so it was a very nice uh, uh, period. Okay, now today I want to talk about. Uh, differences between individuals, and in particular I will focus on individual differences in behavior. Now, we all know from humans that uh, humans differ quite a bit in, uh, in their behavioral tendencies, and this is a very active uh, research field uh, already in, in, in psychology, where people then uh, tried then to classify human uh, behavioral tendencies in terms of uh, all kinds of uh, classification schemes like the five-factor model and so on. But uh, in short, for, for me as a biologist, uh, the important thing is that um, uh, by just seeing one aspect of a certain uh, behavioral tendency of humans, you can often make predictions uh, about uh, their general setup of uh, architecture of their, their behavior. Some people even say that if you just uh, look at the toothpaste of a certain person, that it allows to, you to extrapolate quite a bit uh, on this uh, person's behavior. Now, psychologists are very much interested in, uh, in how these behavioral tendencies are structured, uh, but we as uh, biologists, we are more interested in, uh, in, um, the, in behavioral differences, systematic behavioral differences, not that much uh, what, uh, how, the, how the psychology is structured of uh, individuals, but uh, how they differ in their actual everyday behavior. So this can be seen very clearly if you are doing some uh, economic experiments. So, for example, these are experiments that several people have done, including ourselves. So, if you, uh, if you run experiments, say, on, um, on cooperation problems, uh, so uh, let people play the prisoner's dilemma kind of situation, the public goods kind of experiments, and so on, it's very interesting that there are always a certain fraction of people who always cooperate, despite of the fact that in many of these situations it seems quite silly to cooperate. And uh, others um, never cooperate, irrespective of the, con of the condition, whereas then there's a certain middle ground of people who uh, reciprocate or are playing somewhat intricate kind of strategies. And interestingly is, uh, so we did recently an experiment where we then um, had, uh, we had, we had uh, run experiments some four years ago, and then we asked the same people who had participated in the old experiments again, and to, to do a new set of different kinds of experiments, and it turned out that exactly the same people who were among the unconditional cooperators four years ago were still uh, unconditional cooperators now, and so in that sense it seems to be a rather stable kinds of tendencies. In another set of experiments we also saw that individuals differ quite a bit in their learning styles. So if you just look to what extent, uh, how do individuals learn from each other, then we saw that a certain fraction of the individuals in our experiments, they were not interested in learning at all. Others, more or less, try to find, try to find out what is the majority doing, and then they try to mimic the majority. And then there are some others who try to single out what are the most successful individuals, and then they try to mimic the, individuals, the successful individuals. And again, as I said before, uh, we repeated this experiment with the same set of people uh, over, uh, over, over the years, and uh, these kinds of, uh, of tendencies seem to be quite stable. Now, I'm not, my talk today will not be that much about humans. It will be more about uh, what is nowadays often called animal personalities, or the, the more scientific term is behavioral syndromes in animals. Also, in animals, you find very systematic differences in their behavioral tendencies. And, for example, here you have a female rat, and this uh, rat is confronted with a novel object, and uh, these uh, different rats uh, behave very, very differently when yes, they see such an object for the first time. I don't have time to show some movies, but it's really very nice to see how different the behavioral uh, in, uh, actions, uh, uh, reactions of these rats are. But more interestingly, so if you are a rat expert and you see 
and uh, such a rat um, can uh, interact with a novel object, then this makes um, the expert already uh, allows the expert to make very clear predictions how this rat will behave in a very different kind of context. Maybe, for example, it's fighting fighting with other uh, individuals, or even uh, how uh, they build their nests. So, in other words, as in humans, there seems to be differences in behavior, and these differences in behavior are not only related to a single kind of context, they are, in a sense, consistent to a large extent across different kinds of contexts. So, then the question is, of course, should we call these personalities? Now, uh, pet owners would uh, probably say yes. So, I got, for example, many years ago, I got a letter from a pet owner, and she said, now I have 13 cats, and every one of them has a different personality, and their behaviors are not only different, but consistently so. Uh, but um, uh, I, I don't want to go into this terminology so much, uh, too much. You know, so the times you will see the term personalities in quotation marks. So, I leave it to others to decide on whether this is, um, should be called personality or not. Important is that we find it in virtually all animals uh, uh, that, uh, that have been investigated to, to a considerable extent. I show only very briefly a few examples. So here's an example of, uh, uh, of fish species, cichlids, that are living in larger groups and where some social behavior, and there you see a clear uh, correlation so variation in exploration behavior and in boldness. Boldness means how they behave under novel circumstances, potentially dangerous circumstances. Then you see also a correlation between exploration and aggression. You see uh, exploration and uh, some scent carrying, so that's a cooperative kind of task. And also there is uh, uh, there is also uh, other correlations between different forms of cooperation with, uh, among them. It's really interesting because now in animals we can do experiments that we could never never do in humans, and uh, so they have a very beautiful experiment has been done by the group of Barbara Dabosky, published in 2017 in PNRS, where she very early in the life of these young cichlids uh, uh, subjected them to different kinds of treatments, and what was found out is that within the first month or so of their life, the, 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 the environment that they experienced really had a life-changing effect. Basically, it determined how then these little fish could behave then later as adults at the age of three years. So in all this time in between, they had the same kind of environment, but basically just a very brief period in their life determined then later uh, how, whether they would become a more cooperative helper or whether they would be a breeder in, a, in such a group. I don't want to go into these details, but it's really amazing uh, what, uh, what can be uh, done about the development of these things and, uh, and so on. <coughs> now, this is another example from the, fire, from, uh, from, from the field. These, are, uh, these birds are Western group birds, and they differ enormously in their aggressiveness and also in their cooperativeness. And interestingly, aggressiveness is correlated with their dispersal behavior, so the, the tendency to move out in the open and to, to, to explore new opportunities, all with uh, staying at home. Again, I don't have time to go, go into uh, the system in any, any detail, but uh, this is a system that has been unraveled to a considerable extent, and it turns out that, <clears throat> that without this differentiation, uh, these Western bluebirds would probably have gone extinct. It's really very important for the functioning of the Western bluebirds that their, that their behavioral structure is structured this way. Final example that I want to give before I come to a theory is, um, uh, is something like, say, personality in bacteria. Uh, nowadays, uh, if we uh, study bacterial colonies, we have for the first time in history the opportunity to zoom in into what the individual bacteria are doing. And this has, uh, has led to many amazing discoveries. And one of the most interesting things is that if you take such a small colony of genetically identical individuals, then you see them colored in a different way. This coloration means that they are doing very different things. And they're doing different, th they are doing <coughs> they are different things in a very, very systematic way, as we know this way. So this genetically identical bacteria differs systematically, and consistency in growth patterns, in their usage of metabolic pathways, but also in tasks that we, as humans, would call cooperative tasks that are of importance for the, for the colony. So also at this level, we see uh, quite some variation uh, <coughs> uh, in, in behavior, in structure, in physiology, and so on. Now, from, I am a 
uh, evolution biologist. And uh, for me, the question is now, how can we explain these differences? And uh, the second question is, of course, are they really important? Uh, so what are the causes and the consequences of these differences? It's not that easy to explain these differences, because at first we would think, now, why do differences uh, differ in their behavior? Shouldn't one expect that there is a single behavior optimum, and that everybody should uh, then more adhere to the optimal kind of behavior? So the question is, can we understand uh, whether, <clears throat> why variation, this variation persists uh, in the face of natural selection? In other words, is this variation really adaptive in a certain way? And the other thing is, how can we explain that very different types of behaviors are intrinsically are correlated in different individuals, and often so in many different species correlated in the very same manner? So the question is, is there a kind of explanation for this? Would we expect a more flexible organization of behavior uh, that, that would not really constrain individuals in what they are doing? So that's the question about the adaptive organization of behavior. Now, I and my PhD students and other people in my group, so we are trying to work on a theory uh, for understanding uh, the ecological context of individual differences, the evolution of individual differences, and also development of individual differences. And we do this uh, by applying quite a number of different theoretical, uh, uh, theoretical tools, so modeling uh, from life history theory, use evolutionary game theory, so-called adaptive dynamics, and individual-based simulations. And today I will not give you a kind of systematic account about all kinds of phenomena that, that we see. Today is uh, more about uh, modeling. And I would like to present uh, four different of our four different studies that we have. Most probably it will allow we have time to go uh, to studies from one to three. Where we then, where first uh, uh, will focus then on more uh, simple kind of theoretical principles from life history theory. The second study, I will then show how um, evolutionary game theory can be applied in order to gain some understanding. Then I go to individual-based simulations. And should I have time, I will then say something about uh, evolving neural networks. So in a sense, the, the, the approaches, they become then more and more from old theory to more computational approaches. And the question is then, to what extent uh, does then do the new approaches also add some new insights? Well, the first step that I would like to do is I would like to focus then on the uh, so-called boldness aggressiveness syndrome and um, a very simple kind of hope and that I will, will uh, try to convince you that very simple principles from life history theory can be used to explain this uh, syndrome. Now basically what is this syndrome? The syndrome is always something like a co-variation of different kinds of behaviors and uh, what we see in many mammals, many birds, many fish in general, many, many organisms is that individuals often uh, are different in uh, what is called boldness versus shyness. This means uh, the kind of uh, behavior in novel circumstances and in novel environments. So whether individuals first try to hide in the bushes and to see, uh, be very careful to see how the environment looks like, or whether they uh, move out into the open very readily, then there's a lot of variation in aggressiveness. And then there's also a lot of variation often in dispersive tendencies. Some individuals, they move away from, from, the, from their habitat very readily, whereas others uh, prefer staying at home. And interestingly, in many, many organisms, boldness is associated with aggressiveness and dispersiveness, whereas shyness is associated with non-aggressiveness and philopatric behavior, meaning that uh, staying more at home. The question is now, how can we in interpret this? Now, uh, some years ago, we, when we first uh, went into this, uh, this topic, we thought, now the main difference, so what, 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 which factor bounds all these things together? And I think in our view, it has a lot to do with risk taking. So boldness is a risky behavior, aggressiveness is risky, dispersive uh, going away is, is, is risky, whereas these are more, uh, uh, more kinds of behaviors that uh, are associated with avoiding risks. <laughs> now, if you now look into life history theory, then there is uh, a clear-cut principle that says, says something about when risk should be taken and when risk should be avoided. And uh, in order to explain this, I first have to explain to you the so-called master equation in life history theory. 
Now, life history theory is a theory that has a very sophisticated concept for fitness. And this is based on so-called reproductive values. And these reproductive values here and there, so these are the reproductive values of an individual, say, at age T, and T years, and this is the reproductive value one year later. And the reproductive value tells something about the capacity of an organism in a given state to, uh, to spread its genes to future generations. And that's, uh, there, individuals differ quite a lot. For example, a very old individual has very low uh, capacity to spread uh, its genes, whereas a very young one might also have a very low capacity to spread its genes because uh, it may not survive to adulthood. So there are differences in the capacities to spread the genes. And the main, in the, 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 this master equation tells you that the current reproductive value of an individual at time t corresponds to its current reproductive success plus its future reproductive success. Its current reproductive success is then the number of offspring produced in year number t. And then st is the survival from probability from t year t to year t to year t plus 1. And this is, uh, has to be multiplied with the reproductive value of this individual at this time, t plus 1. So this equation is, I think, uh, is, it looks quite plausible. It can be derived uh, mathematically. But now we can in, in use this equation to understand when individuals should uh, get involved into risky business or not. Now in this case, this is uh, the standard, in, uh, standard kind of uh, situation. So let's now assume that this are the kind of status quo uh, situation so status quo, reproductive output now is F, and the status quo survival is T. And now consider a situation where the individual has to ask itself, uh, am I willing to take the risks or not? The risk means that the survival will be reduced by certain, uh, fact, by certain term C, that's the cost, and then uh, but, uh, but, uh, as, as a reward, it gets then something like B extra offspring. So the question is, to what extent is it, uh, makes it, uh, should I take the risk C on my own survival uh, if this uh, allows me to produce additional offspring here and now? Now, there is a uh, basic thing is, now risk taking behavior like this will be selected if then, in this case, the plus B term is bigger than the C times B plus, C plus, uh, B plus one term, or in other words, if the benefit cost ratio is bigger than B of T plus one. It looks a bit perhaps like an, uh, like an abstract inequality, but basically you should remember what this means. Bt plus 1 is then the future fitness expectations of the individual. So basically this is uh, the fitness that an individual still can expect to have in the future. And uh, what we see here is basically something what it has is called asset protection principle in life history theory. Basically it says only take the risk if you don't have too much to lose. This is what you have to lose, and this is basically what the risks would be worth, in a sense. But if I take now this principle, which is relatively easy, uh, easy to understand, then it explains more or less why the same individuals are bold and the same indi that uh, uh, and aggressive or um, or dispersive, because basically what it says: whenever different individuals differ in their fitness expectations, for whatever reason they are, those with low expectations. So those with a low value here, they should be more prone to take risks than those with a high value of ET plus 1. So in other words, so those with a low expectation should be consistently more risk prone, so more bold, more aggressive, more active, and so on, than those with high fitness expectations. And this uh, simple principle, in a sense, explains, therefore, why different kinds of behaviors uh, are, in a sense, bound together, because uh, all of them have to do uh, with, uh, with uh, risk avoidance. So this basically explains the boldness aggressiveness syndrome, but it also explains other differences in lifestyle. As in humans, you know, also in animals, you find something like the pace of life syndrome. So some individuals have a tendency to live fast and die young, if you're going high risks in order to get some, uh, some uh, high output, whereas others have a much, much more um, hidden lifestyle. And uh, the most important thing here is, is that the simple principle from life history theory is readily testable. And if there's uh, time, then I could in the discussion show, uh, say, say something about some really nice tests of this uh, general kind of idea. So that was more or less 
part one. Part one, more or less said, okay, this is the way how you can explain one kind of uh, co-variation across context by making use of one general old theory, well-established old theory, and uh, which is uh, which uh, is uh, quite nice uh, that we that we have this. Now, in my second uh, in my second study, I come uh, to a very different kind of life history kind of uh, consideration, namely differences in responsiveness to environmental conditions. And for this, I will use then principles of evolutionary game theory to explain uh, the variation that we see in natural populations. Now, the basic facts there is, is that uh, next to the aggressiveness bonus syndrome, there's another very universal syndrome that we find in many, many, many different organisms, namely that individuals differ a lot in so-called coping styles. This means the way how they uh, respond to changes in their environments. So there are always uh, some individuals who are very flexible and so they, they are very uh, open to new information. They, uh, they are constantly screening their environments. They respond to new uh, developments and so on. Whereas other individuals are much more rigid and uh, they, they are more uh, driven by routine-like behavior. So the first are more proactive, the other ones are highly uh, uh, reactive and uh, do not change much uh, whenever, if, if not really required. Now I use uh, for an illustration one example because it is closely uh, related to my history in Bielefeld. Uh, when I uh, was a student, I was student assistant also in our animal behavior course. And one of the experiments that we did, what we did is in one of the Bielefeld parks, there was a pond there and it's uh, based on uh, feeding ducks in a pond uh, where the students throw in bread uh, in a very systematic manner and two different sides of the pond that are far away. So this one, one of the students would perhaps stand here and the other one would stand over there. And basically what they would do is they would then throw in their pieces of bread in a very systematic manner. Now basically what this then means is that the, of course both of them will first attract some ducks but then uh, the, the ducks will then distribute over to two different feeding sites uh, in a way <coughs> that is uh, in, in, uh, in the evolutionary ecology called the ideal free distribution. So basically the prediction from, from evolutionary ecology, it's kind of a game theoretical prediction, is that the ducks should distribute in such a way of the pond that the feeding rate is the same at all feeding places that they have. To be concrete, this is an experiment by Shettleworth already from 1998. And basically, in this case, she had 33 ducks. And then on one side of the pond, uh, she only threw in something like one piece of bread every 10 seconds. And uh, in the other side of the pond, she, uh, she let the students throw in bread every 5 seconds. So in other sense, one side was then twice as profitable as the other ones. And what you see is that the ducks were very readily to follow the ideal free distribution meaning, so that on this less profitable side, then you get half as much bread, only half as many ducks are, uh, are, uh, are uh, concentrating there, whereas then the other two thirds of the ducks then went to the more profitable size. In other words, the ducks then more or less they match in the density, um, the, the throwing rate of the bread uh, in, in, in such a pond. Now this is a very nice experiment. It can, it's very repeatable. You can do it in all kinds of contexts. You can do it not only with ducks, you can do it with, with sticklebacks and with finches and so on. Uh, so individuals, so, uh, so organisms are very well able to find the ideal free distribution. But there's an interesting twist to the story. <coughs> this is uh, this also what we did in, in Bielefeld. Basically, at a certain point, you can first uh, have a certain rate of throwing in bread. And then, after a while, you can then induce the stu uh, ask the students, for example, after four minutes, to change the, uh, the, the rate with which bread is being supplied to the ducks. So in other words, the environment is changing. And what you then see is that at first, uh, if, the, if the profitability ratio is one to one, the ducks then also here, they distributed more or less 50-50 on both sides. And then, after four minutes, the environment changed, and then it took a while until the ducks then more or less adapted to the new kind of regime. But now comes the very interesting part of the story. Uh, when we did this in Bielefeld, we found out over the years that it was always very few ducks who really 
uh, responded to the change in the environment, there were always the same ducks, I still remember the, the, the numbers, but always duck number 17, they were all ringed, who, who was the first to find out that the environment had changed. It was always followed by duck number 21, who found out second that something had changed. There were a few kinds of ducks who always were then the ones who then responded to the change in the environment. And therefore the question that arises is therefore, so why is not everybody responsive? And uh, so why is there variation in responsiveness uh, in, over time? Now the most important insight that you can get from the evolution gain theory is that the benefits of responsiveness are not constant, but the benefits of, the, of, the, of responsiveness depends on uh, the responsiveness of other ducks in the pond. So in other words, it's what, something what we call frequency-dependent selections going on. So you can easily think about it yourself. So if nobody in, in, the, in, in of the pond is responsive to the new check out of an environment, then, uh, then uh, consider two situations. First, that nobody is responsive, and then that everybody is responsive. If nobody is responsive, now then we see that there are clear differences in profitability. So then basically, if, first, uh, if, if at first um, the, if the, the ducks are distributed 50-50, but then, at the advanced side of the pond, then more bread is thrown in, and of course, this is the more profitable side, and, and, and the, 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 the single duck that is responsive then really has uh, all the payoffs by switching to the more profitable side. On the other hand, if everybody is responsive, now then uh, what we get is uh, a real free distribution, so then immediately everybody would then go uh, distribute then uh, over the pond in such a way uh, that the intake rate is the same on both sides. And if the intake rate is the same on both sides, then basically there are no differences in, in, in profitability, and therefore responsiveness does not pay at all. So you can easily uh, do some calculations about this. So if this is the frequency of responsive individuals, then you can see that the payoff of the responsives uh, is very high uh, if there are very few responsive individuals in the population but it drops uh, with, the, with the number of other responsive individuals. This is the payoff of the unresponsives, and if you look at the difference between the two, then you could say this is the benefit of being responsive. So the benefit of being responsive, so the difference between these scores, it goes down to zero after some time, and it just gets zero as soon as the idea of redistribution is being reached. And if we now assume that there are some costs of responsiveness uh, there, and there must be costs because the duck needs to sample the environment in order to find out that the environment has changed. If there are some costs, then we would expect so that uh, basically an equilibrium can come out where the costs equal the benefits. In our case, we would expect something like 30% responsive individuals. And that's actually what we find if we just run some simulations. You see that if we start at the, at the population of unresponsives, then they, then they rapidly evolve then to a state where 30% are responsive, and also in the second simulation, if everybody is responsive, then also the responsiveness drops, and we get now a good interpretation of why not everybody in the population should be responsive, that you should get some kind of equilibrium. I don't have time to, give, to, to go into other twists of the story, for example, why uh, are, uh, are always the same ducks responsive? and uh, why down their switch and things like that. Very interesting questions, but uh, in view of the time, I, I go now to the third topic, because it's very important for me also to, to show you the other kinds of modeling uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, are not that much based on these grand old theories. And uh, the first thing that I would like to uh, show you is then more or less the, the technique of individual-based simulations that is not based on fitness calculations, but where, which were more or less um, than uh, in just populations are simulated in the computer. And basically what one tries to uh, see is where actually uh, evolution then leads to uh, in, uh, in digital organisms. So in silico in a sense uh, that, uh, that are set up to mimic natural kind of populations. And I will try to uh, try, uh, I will explain this uh, in a study that is on the evolution of communication strategies. And the interesting thing is, we did this study without having in mind anything about personalities. And the interesting thing is that the personality differences emerge uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of the simulations. And at first we found it very, very surprising. And nowadays we see it happening in all individual simulations that we are looking at. That's, uh, so I will say a few words about this in the end. 
that it is in real based simulation, we very easily get these kinds of uh, variations, uh, in many cases, very unexpectedly. Now, basically, uh, we were looking for the evolution of communication. And uh, basically, uh, communication you find also in animals quite a lot. And uh, we looked, in this particular case, uh, something like aggressive interactions between uh, something like these house sparrows. You, you, you see that you know these house sparrows, these uh, songbirds, they have something what is called a so-called batch of status. So they have a, something like a black, uh, a black spot uh, below, uh, below their head. And you see there's, there's systematic differences in the size of, uh, of this uh, batch. And this batch is used in their intraspecific communication. So in a sense, this is, is a kind of threat signal. So if, uh, if, if, a, if a typical house sparrow meets another one with a big batch, then uh, it will not easily uh, start a fight uh, over a certain resource uh, that, that is at stake. Whereas if uh, it meets another one with a small batch, then uh, it is much, much more prone uh, to attacking this one. And the interesting thing is now why, how can this signaling system and signal response system, system, how can it have evolved? And how can it be maintained? Uh, we know these kinds of signaling also from sexual selection context, and there one often talks about the handicap principle, so that signals often need to be in handicap in order uh, to, to uh, provide useful information. But to, all, to our best knowledge, now these uh, black spots, uh, they are not really costly. They're very easy to produce, and they do not seem to be handicaps. Not, not, it's not uh, difficult to fake them to a certain extent. The question, therefore, is how can we explain uh, then that such a system has evolved? Now, and, uh, in order to see this, we then set up, as I said, individual-based evolutionary simulations. And it works a little bit like uh, as follows. So you start with a population of N agents, as they're often called, N individuals. And each of these individuals is then individually followed then uh, during its course of life. And within a generation, these individuals, they move around, they interact with each other, and they are, uh, they are then subject to many stochastic events, including death. So some of them die, others then, uh, at certain point, uh, they, may, they run into uh, goods resources or um, uh, low resources, they may reproduce and things like that. But each individual has a genetically inherited strategy that determines on how to behave in a given situation. And uh, this is the most important thing. Successful individuals produce more offspring. And therefore, these uh, uh, individuals uh, that are successful, therefore, inherit, uh, so transmit uh, their, uh, their strategy, the parental strategy, to more offspring. There is some mutation with a low mutation rate in there to create new, uh, new variation. And then over the generations, you see then that uh, strategies in using high uh, survival and or uh, high fecundity they will then outcompete other strategies. That's basically uh, how such an individual-based simulation looks like. It's more or less just uh, mimicking an evolutionary process uh, in a computer. But in our case, uh, the model looked a little bit like this. You assume that individuals they could produce a certain batch of a certain size. We come to this in a moment. And then if you now two individuals meet, and uh, they, um, they, they, they uh, uh, like the opportunity to fight for a certain given resource, well then they have to make a decision on whether to attack or not. And uh, so we assume that there are intrinsic differences in fighting ability, that there is a certain value of the resource, and there is a certain cost uh, of losing a fight. And the basic question is, uh, is then, uh, and they can make their decision on whether to attack the other, depending on their own fighting ability, but also depending on the batch that they see on the other side, for, um, in the other bird. And then the basic question is, then should I really signal my, uh, honestly signal my fighting ability, and, or should I trust the signal sent by my opponent? Now, how can we model this? No, it's very easy, actually. Basically, what we assume, assume then, as I said, every individual has an, in, has an, in, uh, has an inherited behavioral tendency, behavioral strategy, and these strategies take the form of norms of reaction, as we call this. Basically, what it means is that we assume that uh, each individual knows its own fighting ability and has to decide, should I grow a large or a small batch? And the batch, uh, and the, 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 uh, this is decided by, as I said, this norm of reaction, which is determined by two inheritable, inheritable factors A and B. So basically, we assume 
that these birds have two gene, genes, one for the A factor, one for the B factor. And this, uh, basically, we get them all kinds of relationships that could, in principle, evolve something like an S-shaped curve, something like an S-shaped curve downwards, a constant factor, something all, all maximal uh, batch sizes, minimal batch sizes, and things like that. So it's a relatively flexible set of best possible so-called so norms of reactions for the, for the sender strategy. And then for the receiver strategy, we assume that, the, uh, that individuals who then see uh, their dominant, they can make their, 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 their behavior, in this case, the probability of attacking the other one, maybe dependent on their own fighting ability, and also on the perceived batch size of the other individual. And this would be something like a norm, uh, something like the two-dimensional norm of reaction. In this case, it would mean, so individuals that have a high fighting ability, and that are confronted with a batch, with a rival with a small batch size, they would have a very high attack, uh, uh, attack propensity in this case, and if they are relatively weak, have a low fighting ability, and see another individual with a high, uh, a high batch size, now they would then refrain from attacking the other. That would basically be the, the kind of a receiver strategy that could evolve, but many other strategies would also evolve as well. So also very strange kind of strategies. Uh, and again, in this case, this strategy is in this case, uh, again, in, in the genome, of our, our, of our uh, computer agents, and there are three parameters CPE that determine the more or less the shape of this norm of reaction, and again, this can evolve in the course of time. And then there are some simulations, and what I show here is 100 simulations, and uh, basically we start in a situation where everybody has the same batch size, and nobody takes care of the rival's batch size, only they only make their behavior dependent on their own fighting behavior. And then what you see is, in the course uh, of, of the, the generations, you see that the parameters, the average parameters in the population, the A and the B parameters, determine the center strategy, they evolve, and also the CDF uh, terms of the, uh, of the receiver strategies, they also evolve. And as you, and, uh, you should see here, it's not mean plus minus standard error, but it's mean plus minus standard deviation. Basically, you see highly consistently across the 100 simulations, you get the same kind of behavior, and at the end, you get uh, the following outcome, so that, um, that this is the strategy, uh, evolved strategy, how then uh, the signal, uh, so the batch size, uh, reflects the own fighting ability, and this is the evolved uh, behavior, how they respond to own quality and the, and the rival's uh, signal that is being transmitted. And interestingly, what you see is uh, that actually the signal is a reliable signal, because um, the, the, those with the highest fighting ability do indeed, uh, in that sense, honest that they also uh, grow a large batch uh, of status, whereas those with the low fighting ability, they produce a low batch. So we, we more or less thought, okay, that's nice. So we have really now a nice communication system. But now comes the interesting batch, uh, uh, interesting uh, twist to the story. Carlos Botero is a biologist, he did the simulations, and he really goes into the simulations as if studying a natural population, and he really wanted to see what each individual bird is actually doing. And then it turned out, it's quite amazing, that actually the population was not, the individuals in the population, in all the 100 populations, they were not doing the same. They actually, they fell into three different clusters, and uh, of, of birds, where all these three clusters had a very different communication strategy. You had on the one hand, the very aggressive birds that, that, uh, that they, they signal more or less all the time, so they always go to the biggest patch possible, and that, uh, that have a very high tendency to attack. You have on the other hand, very conservative birds, uh, those here, who then only grow a relatively low patch, and they do not fight that often, and you have then uh, this intermediate Type, which uh, signals and responds to signal attract to the signal of the, of the opponent. So basically, what we found was that not a single language had evolved, but actually three coexisting dialects of language had evolved, which is, uh, I think, quite amazing. The first thing is, of course, now does this happen in nature? Now, interestingly, it does. For example, if you take the song sparrows, then, uh, <coughs> then, you, then there are several publications showing that indeed they, they differ in their signaling strategy and they also differ in the response to the signals of others. 
And this has also been shown in other species, like for example, barn swallows and so on. So in a sense, this is really something that seems to be relevant in natural populations. Interestingly, <coughs> what we also see is that, that it, it sheds some new light on the question of honesty. Basically, you see in all of these different types, they are honest in the sense that, that, uh, that the, that the uh, standard strategy is monotonically increasing. In that sense, they are honest, but they are not honest across dialects, uh, because an individual that is um, of this type, that is confronted with an aggressive one, then more or less has the idea that the aggressive one is cheating, because it, even if it's weak, the aggressive one, it always produces a very large batch, and so on. I come to the end. So basically, the, 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 the conclusions that we can draw is then, um, first of all, that, uh, uh, that uh, these uh, reliable signals, they can evolve from scratch. And, uh, but very interestingly is that uh, these kinds of systems lead often to um, the individual variation in, in, in these strategies. And, uh, these, uh, and the fact is that, that different birds communicate in a different way. They also, that also means that they behave in a very different way. So this is an alternative explanation for personality. And the other thing that we see is that honesty and deceit are very tricky issues when the various dialects coexist. The final point that I would like to make, so first of all, that uh, it shows that these individual-based models, so these small modern kinds of models, have surprising outcomes. And I don't want to go into, uh, into it, but basically uh, what we now see is that whenever you run individual-based simulations and you do not find the emergence of variation, then you are surprised, whereas we formerly were surprised that we did find this, in, uh, this, this, uh, this kind of variation. So we find it in many different kinds of models that we, uh, that we made. We made models of statistical so and inference, or learning strategies, epigenetic inheritance, and so on. So uh, they commonly result uh, in polymorphic outcomes. And so in other words, uh, this is a very different kind of, uh, of explanation for, uh, for the emergence then of polymorphism. And I don't have time for going into it anymore. And I think it's best to stop here to have some time uh, for questions. Thank you.